Hello, everybody. Welcome into Eminem and M Across the Board. Sean Martin, Eric McDowell, Ashley w Miller with you, as we are every week. And this week, guys, I know, listen, we always say NFL is king. NFL is really king this week because on a week when Tom Brady retires and he's not the first thing we're talking about, you know it's been a big week. We have our Super Bowl matchup set. We'll relive the AFC and F NFC championship games and the coaching hires that have happened, those that still haven't. But the biggest news that broke Yesterday, we're taping this on a Wednesday. The biggest news that broke Tuesday uh, night was Brian Flores and his lawsuit that he is bringing against the NFL and three teams, Broncos, Giants, Dolphins. And guys, it's pretty scandalous. I just want to get your initial thoughts on what you've read, and we can kind of go from there. Yeah, uh, first, it's a 58-page document, right? So... When I first hear of it, I think about where we're, this is. This is a sports story because it's Brian Flores, it's the mm -hmm. NFL. But when you look at what's going on in this country now, where there's rallies with Nazi swastika flags and the um, the Southern Confederate flag, the, as disgusting as it is, it's prevalent. This is a society thing, and the NFL is part of it. And I think there's no racism in the NFL or in sports in general is is naive. You know, there's going to be. The, the percentages say there are. Um, a couple things. One, I applaud Brian Flores because he may have just torpedoed his career for the for the better good and good for him for taking the stand and doing this. He saw some injustices. You know, the Belichick text we'll get into a little mm -hmm. bit. Just yeah, at least at least Belichick could say, I don't see color with my former uh. coaches. Sorry, had to say it. But the thing with Flores is this. I... You know, and then the tanking thing we'll get there. Here's the problem I have. The Rooney rule to me serves a purpose, but it's it's misused. Okay. Correct. It serves a purpose when you have a Gerard Mayo, the Patriots linebacker coach, getting lined up for head coaching interviews like he did in Vegas and I think one or two other spots. It gives him a chance, A, to interview, to get that experience and to get his name out there. Was he a serious candidate in Las Vegas? No. No. First it was going to be Harbaugh and it turned into Josh McDaniels. But it gave Mayo a greater form to get his name out there. And that's a good thing that he can get some increased visibility. The bad thing is he's interviewing for a job he's not going to get. And that's a problem. And that's where Brian Flores is saying. Now, the problem Brian Flores has is if I'm an NFL coach and I just had, say, a defensive coach use Denver, Vic Banjo is a defensive guy, you want to switch it up and hire an offensive-minded coach. It doesn't matter if Brian Flores is black, brown, white, yellow, purple. If he's a defensive-oriented coach, that might not be what the co what the, the the owner is looking for, and that's the challenge within that rule. Is it fair? No, but a, an owner should be able to hire who he wants. Um, that said, Brian Flores got got absolutely screwed in Miami. Never should have lost his job. First back-to-back mm -hmm. -back winning season since two thousand three, and he's out of work. And I'm hearing this morning one theory was. He was Stephen Ross was so mad at him for not tanking if that allegation is true back in 2019 because they wanted the first pick, which turned out to be Joe Burrow. Did Stephen Ross see what Joe Burrow did for Cincinnati and say, Jesus, if my coach had just taken the money and, and tanked our football team, we might have Joe Burrow in South Beach right now? Let, let me start at the top first, you two, is that. Uh, it, it's great to see some new head coaches, new mm -hmm. faces, head coaches. Okay. But how about an African-American owner in the national football league? When do we have to wait for that to occur? That, that's truly remarkable to me. So it, it starts at the top. I thought the Rooney rule had, had a good reason. Yes. The owners can hire who they want, but this, you know, Tony Dungy worked out great. Jim Caldwell, there's many of them. Uh, I had a coach uh, at Cal Poly who was tremendous and he, he hasn't gotten that head coaching opportunity, but he was in the Viking staff for many years as an assistant. And, you know, you don't want to broach it with him because they get very upset about it. I I credit Flores. Uh, I don't think his career is over because I can see him winding back up in Foxborough because the man there is very <laughs> loyal to his uh, people. I, no, I'm talking about an assistant because he no, was. No, I know, but I'm not sure that, like, isn't that going to be pretty awkward? We haven't gotten into that yet, but. <laughs> well, Brian Flores came out this morning on CNN and said it was humiliating to receive those text messages from Belichick. I'm sure it was. And that's not to say yeah. that Belichick didn't mean well, but I don't right. know that that's going to work 
quite the way you think it might between those two anymore. You don't know. No, I know. I know. It's a little different. What I'm saying is, is that the the guy is loyal, or he wouldn't have oh, done the no test. Doubt. I mean, you look, you look. He brought back Patricia. Everybody rips him about a head coach mm -hmm. job, but the guy's a good defensive assistant. He's probably going to bring O'Brien back. Okay, the one person <laughs> he never, he'll probably bring Judge back. But the fact is, one guy he'll never bring back is Eric Mangenius because Mangini burned Belichick, the Patriots, and where is he now? So. But as for this matter, it's very disconcerting. Sean, you're right. In society, we see this. I thought growing up in the 60s that that would be the end of it. And uh, very, very upsetting. And I commend him for taking a stand on this. And I hope things work out for him. Yeah, listen, I, he's a clearly qualified to be a head coach in the NFL. What he did with the Dolphins, there aren't many people who were able to do that outside of Don Shula in that organization. It's a tough place to win. And he did it despite an ownership group that was clearly working against him, according to him, which it blows your mind. If all of the stuff that has been said by him specifically regarding Miami is true, you got to tear that thing down from the top to the bottom. You tear it down because that's disgusting. It's all disgusting. As yeah. for the Giants, this is where the Rooney rule plays in. And this is the problem I have with it. The idea of it is fantastic. Yes, everyone deserves equal opportunity to interview. But the second Joe Shane got hired as the Giants general manager, the leading candidate for that job was Brian Dable. Everyone under the sun was saying Brian Dable was going to get that job. So now you've basically given Brian Dable the job and you are forcing the New York Giants to interview Leslie Frazier and Brian Flores for reasons that are not what they should be. Yeah. If they decided, this is the same thing as the Broncos. If they decided they needed an offensive coach and Brian Dable was the singular one of six candidates that had offensive, he was an offensive minded coach. If they had already decided that he was their guy, why are you forcing them to now interview Brian Flores? That's a slap in the face to Brian Flores. Hey, come in here and let's go through the semantics, but you're going back out the door because we already yeah, have the, our guy. The four letter word token. That's what that yeah. is. And that's, that is flat out wrong. Right. And that's the biggest problem with the Rooney rule. I don't think, you know, it, it's the problem that like you're handcuffing people into then giving these guys interviews. And it, I don't think, it, you know, I don't know that I agree that Gerard Mayo is not a serious candidate. You're not going to interview anyone who's not a serious candidate, but you can't be interviewing guys if you've already given out the job as Bill Belichick seems to imply happened four days before Flores even came in for an interview. That's messed up. But with, this is what the league has created. The thing with Mayo is he's never even been a coordinator, so I don't know how serious he can be yeah. just for that for that purpose. Um, the other part, and there's so much that happened here that was crazy. The biggest mistake the NFL, and I love it because I'm not a fan of Roger Goodell. I, I, I've said it before in the show. If I didn't love so football so much, I would hate the NFL, just their mm -hmm. arrogance, because they know people aren't going to get after them. Network media isn't going to, because they're all tied to them, and they get billions of dollars in advertising revenue. The biggest mistake the NFL made yesterday was release that statement within oh. a few hours saying that uh, this has no merit. Well, how do you know it has no merit? Did you do an investigation yeah. in the last two hours? That was that was insane. And I that, wanted that to be like, up. F off, you idiots. What? How dare you come out and say, look, a clearly no investigation. And and you may think that the NFL as an organization, Goodell, whatever, that you're upholding some standard. Are you going to speak on behalf of the Miami Dolphins and the New York Giants? And and you know exactly what happened in those organizations and say there's no merit to what Brian Flores is saying. If I'm Brian Flores, I sue him again. <laughs> the fundamental thing is a PR person in sports and probably in any company, you make a statement when you are prepared that every word you say is fact or, that, or at least you believe so from what you know. So to make a knee-jerk statement is a disaster on any single level, and especially in today and especially at that level. There is no rush to make a statement. Again, we go with the Spreewell thing, the, the largest thing I'd ever worked with. We, we met, we discussed, and then we said, here is our statement. Because if you make a statement that quickly, there's no way in the world you could have investigated, got no. the owners, and got all that in place. You have to take the time to do the right thing in a statement. 
Yeah, what a joke. Uh, I think, you know, listen, the Broncos, we didn't really touch on that. Uh, Flores is alleging that in 2019, when he interviewed for that job, he, the management, which includes John Elway as general manager, showed up an hour late to the interview. They were all hungover. They were out drinking the night before. The Broncos have come out and said, that's not true. It started on time. We have documentation of everything that happened. It sounds like they have their ducks in a row, maybe more than anyone else. But as for the Giants and the Dolphins, there could be some there could be some issues there. All right, I have a question for you, Sean, and both of you, actually, yeah. is that, okay, does he become uh, combustible now, Flores, and becomes the next Kaepernick and touchable? Or does somebody hire him and then media and people will rip up the owner and the team? You're just hiring because, no. If somebody's going to hire him, they're hiring him on merit. It's not mm-hmm. to sell tickets and to say we're nice people. So which will it be? I think he. I don't think he's the next Kaepernick, but maybe I'm naive because it's very possible. I mean, he he knows the risks. I'm sure he knows that he may be putting his, ending his career as a coach, and I think he said this said that on CNN this morning. But this is bigger than him in his mind, from what I've heard, and and I guess the, the, he's not asking for a whole ton of money here. He wants to help change the system and cause cause some change here. And then to raise the awareness and, and get an institutional change within the NFL because, you know, look, there's 70% of the players are, are black, okay? So should 70% of the coaches be black? No. But it should be more than one. You right. know, the, the diversity has gone. I mean, David Culley in Houston, that was a bad football team this year playing their asses off at the mm-hmm. end of the year, and he gets fired. Mm-hmm. Brian Flores, that team could have gone in the, what were they, one and seven at one point, and mm-hmm. they got hot, and they, they over 500. Yep. I mean, if nothing else, you could tell the players want to play for these guys, yeah. and they're going to yep. play hard. Um, you know, Brian Flores, I can't believe he hasn't gotten a job before this, because everybody figured when he got let go in Miami, he'd be able to name his shot, mm-hmm. and he hasn't. And I, I don't think, I, I think it's wrong to say every single case is racism, but I I, it's got to, to me, it, you can't rule it out that at least in some cases that it's out there because it's very prevalent in our society. And it's become the norm and accepted in the last five years to express your hate. That's our society right now. And it, it sucks. Yeah. Listen, I, I don't think he's Colin Kaepernick. I'm going to try to say how I think it's different without offending anyone. When it comes down to it, Colin Kaepernick, whether he meant it or not, and you know, he didn't mean it offended certain groups of people that made him unable to overcome. He offended veterans. He offended police. He offended family of the, uh, families of those people. He offended entitled white people who were offended for no freaking reason. That is very difficult to overcome. The difference here is that I don't think that Flores has done the same thing. He's offended oh, no. ownership, he has, maybe, but no, specific has, owners. No. What my point, Ashley, is that does he become Kaepernick, meaning untouchable? No, and that's what I mean. I don't think do not do not interlope at all. What I'm concerned with is that Flores gets, you know, untouched. They won't look at him and all of that, just like Kaepernick. Kaepernick right now could come out of his home and start for at least four teams right now. Oh, you don't know that. He's been gone for a long time. He's been gone for a long time. And the reason I didn't have any sympathy for Kaepernick. He opted out of his last year in San Francisco, like 18 million bucks. He wanted to get out of there, go try something else. He got blackballed for sure. But I also know when teams were were at least saying they were talking to him, at least given the perception that he was demanding starters money and he'd been out of the game for a little while. And that's sometimes not how it works. Yeah, I I don't think he I don't think Flores gets blackballed the same way that Kaepernick does. But that was my point. He he didn't offend people who Obviously, owners can keep him from getting jobs. But if you are an ownership group and you're a team that needs a coach and you do things the right way, why would you not hire Brian Flores? Number one, he's on every freaking television set in America for standing up for what's right and doing the right thing. That's the guy you want on your team. If you want a defensive-minded coach and you want a guy who's going to do what's right, and he has, and he said the things that he said in terms of telling no to Stephen Ross for the money, telling no to Stephen Ross for tampering by recruiting quarterback. If he did all of those things, then good for that guy because he's one of 32 coaches in the NFL who would have done 
all of those things across the board. How so about we smart, hire the best okay. person? Okay. Yeah. In the NFL, it's always, you know, in baseball, only once did I see it where they said, we're going to hire our pitching coach as a manager. Mm -hmm. Stop it. Okay. You want an offensive minded coach, and then all of a sudden the defense stinks. And now you're going to find a defense. How about the best person mm -hmm. available? Everybody's going to come in with all their papers and statistics and all that. But in hirings, I've been at different levels again. You feel it. Okay. I feel it. And if I'm an owner and I feel a connection with that person, in many cases, I went to ADs and said, that person's the right one. She's the one. Boom. Sometimes we're right. Sometimes maybe not. But the fact is, get the best person yeah. and stop looking at the philosophy of it's always he's going to develop the great quarterback. All right. So what about the defense? OK, get the best person. And this man, obviously, they respond to good people. Or you don't win seven in a row in right. the National Football League. <laughs> Yeah, you got five job openings. One of them's the Dolphins, so you've got four. It doesn't sound like he's in the mix for the Vikings, but everyone else, I mean, Texans, I believe he interviewed for, yeah. Jag Saints. Why wouldn't the Jags or the Saints hire that guy? The Saints have an incredible defense, and if he brings somebody in who can teach the offense, and same thing, I think the Jags are a young team that needs someone to inspire them to right. play for, and that's that's your guy. If you're not going to go for Brian uh, Byron Leftwich, what about Brian Flores? Um, so I think there are still options. The question will be, is he too legally entangled in this lawsuit to get hired by someone and just have too much going on and too much right. to be settled? I would understand that. But if you're not going to get hired this year, then is that going to then curtail things kind of for the rest of the way? Yeah, like I said before, I'm, I'm shocked he didn't have a job before all this. Well, listen, there's still five job openings, though. He didn't get well, there four are still five, jobs. But, you know, maybe Houston is the right place for him. I don't know. I know he interviewed there, and I, I think yep. you said New Orleans, too. Um, <coughs> well, I don't know what Minnesota's doing. I think Jim Harbaugh is going to, if he wants it, he's going to get it. So Yeah. Well, can we'll we uh, throw a smile out there to you? Because, Ashley, this is going to be fun uh, to hear Mr. Raider now root for Josh McDaniels. I, think, I mean, that would be like me rooting for Johnny Damon wearing pinstripes, I guess. Tom Brady's but BFF. I, I, I want to say first that I'm very happy for Josh McDaniels. I'm, I feel bad for Mac Brown, to be honest with you. And I feel, you know, that there's, there's, got a, there's a lot of things that Josh McDaniels did. Brady would be the first to mention it if he ever mentions his previous franchise in the near future. But <laughs> Josh McDaniels is ready. It's a tremendous hire. I said this to Sean yesterday. He, he learned from one of the best. The thing that surprised me is that it tells me that BB isn't about to retire. I, I just assumed that McDaniels would stay there and take over and be like the Dodgers when they had, you know, two managers over 50 years or whatever. So it is a statement in that respect. But I think, I think that J David Carr, who was already coming up like this, has to be happy. And I think McDaniels is a tremendous hire. And the fact that he got the GM from New England also takes a lot of pressure off of him as well. Don't compare McDaniels to the one that was in Denver. It's like con comparing Terry Francona to the one in Philadelphia. Best analogy yet. I think the hire sucks. <laughs> really? Why? Well, I know you wanted the interim guy. I'll give you that. I wanted Coach Rich, who's actually being right. interviewed for Jacksonville for their head coaching job. Now, I did want Passaccia, and then I wanted Harbaugh. The only thing with Harbaugh is that as quickly as that rumor came up, it faded away fast. I think his people compared notes with Mark Davis, and it just wasn't a good fit. How often does his name come up and then just disappear off the face right. of the yeah. Here's my problem with McDaniels. I can only go by sample size, and he drafted Tim Tebow in the first round. I know it was a long time ago. He says he the thing I liked about him in his introductory presser was that he admitted to his mistakes in Denver. Right. So I'll give him the benefit of the doubt that maybe he learned. Um, that said, just because a guy coaches with Bill Belichick doesn't mean he's going to be a good NFL coach. Joe it, Joe. Doesn't, it doesn't hurt. Seriously. No, sure. Well, again, look at sample size. You could say that in theory, but look at all the Belichick tree that's gone out there. None of the best is Brian Flores. Matt Patricia failed. Bangini failed. Cornell failed. Charlie Weiss failed. McDaniels failed. Who'd I miss? Right? That's a lot of failure. Okay? They're not all Belichick. There's only one Belichick. So just because they learn from him doesn't mean a thing. Again, now the positive for McDaniels, it was his offense. He's imaginative. They were sixth in red zone offense last year, and the Raider red zone offense was atrocious. 
So I'll get behind him because he's our coach. I'm skeptical. He's not the guy I wanted, but you know what? Mark Davis didn't call me and ask. So yeah, that's who I got. And uh, and the coaches you mentioned did not walk into 10 and five or 12 win teams either. And many of them, Cornell, for an example, they walk into disasters, get fired. But then what happens when somebody wants an interim coach? They hire Cornell. So, you know, it's true. A lot of them didn't have success. But guys, Ashley, and coaches aren't getting the time anymore. We said at the yeah. start of the year, yeah. the youth and coach, he won't be fired. One yeah. year. Give them three at least. Yeah. And listen, Matt Patricia lost in Detroit. How many people have lost in Detroit? I don't know that right. he can't be a good head coach somewhere, but sometimes the situation dictates some of that. McDaniels isn't my favorite hire. I, I wasn't keen on him in Denver, but it doesn't mean I don't think he should get a second chance. I'll be interested to see how he does here. He has, and we said this, he's got a playoff team. He's one of the few coaches who yeah. is inheriting what is already a playoff team. So you yeah. fail there. And you are going to have a short leash. The rest of these coaches will have a little bit of a longer leash because they're taking over rebuilds and projects. You're taking over Derek Carr and the keys to a pretty nice car. So I think the pressure is going to be on McDaniels to win and win pretty quickly. Yeah, and they have 30, 40 million bucks under the cap mm -hmm. to play right. with too. So the opportunity is there. We'll see. Here's the here's the and more good parts. McDaniels, the Pats have always been a tight end oriented offense. He's got two great tight ends in yep. Vegas mm -hmm. with Waller and Foster yep. Moreau. Yep. A feature back in Josh Jacobs that he got himself going the last month of the year. Probably is going to pick up his option now because uh, he he started running angry toward the end of the year. But we'll see. You know, and I think the players are coming around. I think they all wanted Basaccia. Nate Hobbs posted a great note to, to coach the other day. But you know what? Once you get into OTAs and all that stuff and they're professionals and, and you got to move on and, and go play the game. We will see uh, how he does. Uh, I think it'd be an interesting scheduling quirk at the NFL, maybe the opening Sunday night game. They, they sent the Patriots out to Vegas because they're going out this year. Um, you know, just a little sidelight there. So so we'll see. Again, he's my coach. I'll support him, but yeah, not not what I wanted. He was at best my third option. Yeah. I, I think my favorite hire, honestly, was the Giants hire because it's what they needed. They needed an offensive – that offense was 31st in the freaking league last year. They've been atrocious. Daniel Jones has issues. They need someone offensive. And if it wasn't Dable, then my second choice would have been Brian Flores, without a doubt, because they need to be inspired. And there hasn't been a coach in New York that's inspired anyone in the last six years. So I love the Dable hire. Be interested to see what happens with it. I'll also be interested, though, like – I feel like there are certain trends. I'm glad there weren't a lot of recycles. Like you hear the name and I get it, Jim Caldwell, but like you hear these names of guys who have already had chances being brought back up. I like the idea of giving new guys chances, mm -hmm. but a yeah. guy like Nathaniel Hackett, he's the Packers offensive coordinator. Last time I checked, Matt LaFleur, Matt LaFleur calls the plays for the Green Bay Packers. <laughs> so what exactly do we think we're getting in a guy like Nathaniel Hackett with Denver? <laughs> I know Buffalo fans were thrilled when he left Buffalo mm -hmm. to go to Green Bay. Here's the other name. You talk about guys not calling plays. Eric Bieniemy. Yep. Pretty good run in Kansas City. Can't get – he must be the worst job interviewee in, in yeah, sports. He's only really – I think he only interviewed for one job, though, of these. You yeah, haven't heard his name this work. year, and nope. it's amazing. I would have, I would rather have enemy in Vegas than than Josh. Yeah, McCann. he interviewed well, for one job, and I forget Mayo which one too. it was. Much more qualified than Mayo. <laughs> yeah. But Carwell yeah. is is an old name recycle, but it's like Dungey. They, there are people that have done a great job before. Yeah. I think Caldwell would be an excellent hire for a, a, maybe a young team that needs some veteran leadership in the role. I, I want to throw this out to you about Jimmy G. I, I got to think he's done. I, I think he's done in San Francisco. I don't understand the well, contract they threw at him. When they threw the money at him, he had not had a lot of mileage on his arm, and he hadn't really proven a lot at that point. Um, I think it was the logo and where he was playing that got him the contract. But he's going to get a job. You've got Denver, New Orleans, Philadelphia. There's more QB jobs open out right now. If you go to Indeed, there's probably 12 quarterback-needed <laughs> jobs right now. But I will say this. I mean, we saw that last play. He just looked totally out of it. He almost ran out of the stadium in that game. But bottom line, the guy was 35 and 15. They loved him in the mm -hmm. locker room. So that's going to get him another yep. starting shot, don't you think? Yeah. He'll, he'll get one, but he looked 
he looked awful. Awful. In the set, I mean, awful. He looked like he was out of place in the second yeah. half of that game. And I've always wondered why why did the Niner fans not like him so much? And I saw it uh, in the second half of that yeah. game. Didn't it look like like a dog was chasing him on that play? Or something? <laughs> but they, I mean, it's only going to cost them under two million to let him go, and they've got the quarterback of the future, and he's handling it well, and saying, you know, he knows he's gone, and hopefully they'll find a winning situation. I don't yeah, know listen, what that is. Pittsburgh. He's, he's been a dream because he could throw a freaking fit and you know be really difficult. And he came out and said, "It's been a great ride. I know I'm getting traded," despite. John Lynch and everyone else saying like, well, no, no, we haven't decided. Well, clearly you have, because he knows something that the rest of us don't know. He yes, said he's cool. done. Um, he seems to be open to working with them to find a place that will be good for him. Even if he, listen, I get it. He can't be a backup quarterback because he's going to cost you way too much money. My guess is, is they'll figure out some sort of extension that will curtail how that money is spread out over the long term. If he's smart, that's what he'll do. My guess is, is he's going to be in a quarterback competition. Even if he goes to a place like Philadelphia, he will be competing with Jalen Hurts. Um, I think I made this comparison a couple weeks ago. He reminds me of Ryan Tannehill. He can do just enough, but sometimes you have to win in spite of him. And if he's throwing 25 plus times, you're probably not. Winning. Yeah, that's a great analogy, right, Sean? No question. Yeah. I'd look at him in New Orleans, too. Yeah, no doubt. Or even, even Tampa Bay. They're yep. going to go through their uh, overhaul now. No doubt. Lane Gabbard ain't it. Yeah, and, and that's the thing. I think he can be a starting quarterback. Is he going to get XYZ team back to a Super Bowl? I don't know, but he's done a damn good job of getting them to championship games already. So if you're a team that needs one, you take that guy. Speaking of Tampa, Eric, the Woo! Nause nauseating jersey over your shoulder. When the story you come around. What's that? When will he ever come around, Ashley? Uh -uh. Tom Brady admits he fumbled 20 years ago. I'll give him some give him some slack. All right. He'd probably uh, admit need, if you ask him now. I need closure. All right. I'm not going to pick the best games, okay? I just want – just listen to me and absorb what I'm about to say, okay? Right. Uh, because I, I grew up with the Patriots, and they were the fourth of the four teams in Boston. They were hideous, okay? Listen to the numbers. Most titles, one player, seven. If any of these come and say, oh, that'll be broken, I'd like to know who. Most yeah, wins, 277. Game-winning drive, 67. TD passes, 707. I love this one. Combined passing yards with playoffs, 96,000. I sound like Pat Sajak. 96,969. Now, that would mean that if I'm in Foxborough, he could th throw passes to me and – that would take me all the way over the canal and on to Cape Cod. That's how far that is, okay? Playoff wins, 35. Playoff TD passes, 83. And, of course, the big ones, 15 Pro Bowl, five Super Bowl MVP, three NFL MVP, the seven titles. He missed the playoffs three times in 21 full seasons. Remember, in the first year, he only threw a pass. Mm -hmm. And I am fortunate to say I counted that I'd seen him in person five times and as I mentioned last week, the AFC championship win. And then two weeks later, he got his first one, first Super Bowl. So he's he's right on the Mount Rushmore of Boston, New England sports. Bill Russell, Bobby Orr, Ted Williams, and him. And I just want to say thanks to the GOAT. And I know he didn't mention his previous employer, but... Uh, but he's we going to retire a Patriot, sign a one-day contract. Sign a one-day, yeah. But we won't ever... We'll that never see anybody out. like that again. He's I just don't do think it. we'll ever see that again. Look, I'm I'm the negative guy here because that's just who I am. And the other day you said you were the positive guy. You like to live your life positively and I, I do, but like I said, I'm a man of many moods. Oh. Uh yeah. So I, I, I didn't read the Instagram post because I didn't want to, but I heard him not mentioning Why not? you weren't gonna celebrate. He likes to get my goat. Get it? No, nah, just move on. I'm just trying to irritate Eric now. Get my I, I get not mentioning <laughs> Belichick, but leaving the Pats out of the uh, out of the novel that he wrote, I'm stunned by that. To not thank the fans, or even I thought he was really tight with Robert Kraft. Nobody, no mention, right? Is that Eric? How does that sit? I wasn't pleased until then. I saw Kraft 
through a right. note and then he mentioned it. So he and then he responded to it. Don't know what he's thinking there. I think uh there's been messy exits. We remember Bobby Orr going to the Blackhawks. That was the agent's fault. So time does heal all the wounds. I think uh, you know, he left technically on his terms and can't look back at that and just look at what he's accomplished. I'm trying to look as a sports fan without the emotional side of it. If Derek Jeter, I said the same thing. Didn't matter where I grew up. Derek Jeter's immortal, tremendous career. This is where I'm coming from. This career, I don't think will ever even come close to being duplicated. And we're all fortunate that we saw somebody like this play in person and TV too. Listen, I get it. But if you're super offended, then remember that he won you six Super Bowls. Exactly. Like, he did you everything you needed him to do. You don't need him to pat you on the back for you going to sit and cheer for him. He won you six freaking Super Bowls. Of course you'll like him. Uh, yeah, I used to hate him a lot more than I do. I'm so glad that he became a little bit more likable as his career went on, a little bit less obnoxious and arrogant, because I really, I mean, he used to be like top of my most hated people list, and he <laughs> gradually worked his way down, which I'm glad he did, because I've enjoyed enjoying watching him versus – hating watching him. Uh, It will never be duplicated. For those people out there who are going to say that because of Patrick Mahomes' age, he has a chance to win seven Super Bowls, well, since he won one, look what's happened. It is not easy. And that's what people – like, seven Super Bowls, if you play 14 years, which is a good career in the NFL for a quarterback, 14 seasons, you'd have to win half – Super Bowls in half of those seasons. Ask Marino. Ask Dan Marino. He's the outlier. That's one. He played 22 seasons, which the longevity is part of the what's allowed him to be so successful and to win so many. Yes, but you have to get there, number one, and then you've got to win the games. He got there 10 times in 20. He got there half of his career. He got to the Super Bowl <laughs> and won them seven out of 10. He's 70 percent winning percentage in the Super Bowl. Come on. Nobody's ever doing that again, ever. All right. I, you know, we'll go to Mahomes. You picked up on it. I mean, he's taking a lot of heat for Sunday. They score touchdowns their first three, first three possessions. Mm-hmm. I'm watching guys on Monday, Rex Ryan, and he's kind of a blowhard, but he's been around the game a long time. He said, I saw a guy that lost his confidence. And, and Andy Reid, we talk about leaving points on the board, five oh, seconds God. left at the end of the half. First half. Andy Reid lets his, quarter, lets his quarterback, who thinks he's superhuman, he's very good, but he's not mm-hmm. that good. You can't you, you can't stop the the time continuum, right? Um, for him to allow another play to go on, and uh, that was catastrophic for two reasons. One, you're up 21 10, 24 to 10, and getting the ball to start the third quarter is a real good one. 28 10 is better, but 24 to 10 is good. But they got the stop, and the Bengals, from what you've heard, is they were tearing the paint off the walls in the locker room. They were so happy with momentum, and they brought it out and took it to them in the third. Just an awful move by Andy Reid. He let his quarterback make the decision for him, and uh, it gave the Bengals all the momentum they needed into the second half. You you can't take the three points or an extra point away in the first half. You just can't nope. do it. Take and the then points. the the play call was horrendous, Sean, because Tyreek Hill was behind the line of scrimmage. Yep. He dumped it off to him. And you're that close. What are they all going to go in the end zone? Of course not. This stuff's got to stop with this these first half decisions. And if the Cincy kicker hasn't taught people about how to do it, Ooh, then wee. just watch him win games while you lose games by not kicking. Yeah. I love that Cincinnati has gotten behind the, like, this is why you draft a kicker. And they're not <laughs> wrong. Like, if you're a good football team, go get a good freaking kicker because that guy is going to win you games over and over and over like Evan McPherson has done for Cincinnati this year, who, I mean, the story is absurd. When we talked to our guest last week, which he didn't pick the Bengals, I think, uh, did we all pick the Chiefs? I think we all picked the Chiefs. Yeah. Um, But I did say, if, I think the Chiefs are going to win, but if at the end of the day, the Bengals win, I will not be surprised. And you know what? I was a little surprised after it was 21-3. But at the end of the day, not surprised that the Bengals won and are going to the Super Bowl. Aside from the fact that they won four freaking games last year and two games the year before, and now they're in the Super Bowl. It's a turnaround that I'm not sure. I, I would have to look at history, but it's got to be one of the best ever. 6-25-1 and one in the previous two seasons. Yep. Okay. Adam Vinatieri played 32 career games. He had three playoff games with four or more field goals. This kid's done it his first three playoff games, yep. and he's not even done. Sean, this is amazing. Guys, I got I to gotta step away for one second, okay? All right. 
continue talking amongst yourselves. We're gonna. <laughs> we'll keep talking. Oh, he's no, I, Ashley, I think we should all go out to Chile for what's happened in Cincinnati. Two years it, ago, two wins, and absolutely. And, and the coach is a young, exciting coach. And, and I think they want to play for him. You see that. No question. Yeah. You see that they want to play for him. And he's a McVay guy, too, which you see that they want to play for McVay. They're very similar, Zach Taylor and McVay. Um, I think they want to play for him. I also think like, so since Cincinnati, I'm loving, I love the idea. Did you hear about the game ball? They bring the game ball to a yes. different, like yes. they brought it to a, I think it, they brought it this past week to a black owned bar. One, of, it, I think it was one of the first black owned bars in Cincinnati. Zach Taylor walked in, gave them the game ball. He's gone other places in Cincinnati and Cincinnati gave their public schools the day off on Monday. Following I was going to say, bowl. isn't that great because of these late starts? So they yep. can enjoy it. There has been no better decision made in all of history than that. I mean, yep. kids don't have to go to school on Monday. And it's going to be fantastic. They get to enjoy the Super Bowl, love their team as they should. I think let, let's do a national holiday day after the Super Bowl. Take it we'll off. Move it to a Saturday. Yeah. Super Bowl and here's Saturday. The, we talk about Brady Manning. The new one is now it's going to be uh, Mahomes and Allen. And here's Burrow saying, not so quick, not yeah. so fast, see? So the, it's so exciting to see these young quarterbacks and the, what they're doing already and what we can look forward to from them in the future. And the no best one... part – sorry, the best Go part ahead. about Sunday's win for the Bengals, don't have to listen or watch or hear from Brittany Matthews or Jackson Mahomes. Thank <laughs> goodness. Well, Go we're glad you're happy about it. Um, no one, no quarterback has ever won the Heisman, a national championship, and a Super Bowl. Joe Burrow can do it in three years. Yeah. Three years. Three years. I mean, he'll be the first to do it if he ever wins a Super Bowl in his career, but he could do it in a very short amount of time, even if it's not this year. What hurts me about Joe Burrow, I, I like Joe Burrow. I think he's me good for, for the game. I, I like mm -hmm. his cockiness. He's got a little edge to him, but he's also mm -hmm. very humble, and mm -hmm. he seems like a good guy. When Joe Burrow left Ohio State, he wanted – he called Nebraska. His dad played at Nebraska. Oh. And they talked to Mike Riley, and he goes, I hey, don't really fit our system here. Said, well, yeah, your system has you 4-9 and nine every year, you jackass 4-8. and eight. So he went to LSU instead and put up the greatest single season oh. in college football history. I mean, and, and great for the city of Cincinnati, okay? Because the Reds should be on HGTV. They, they tear that place. Call the Property Brothers because every <laughs> second year the Reds get torn down to the beam and rebuild. Enough of that, okay? So it's great for the people of Cincinnati. Been there a couple times. and just They, they have a malaise. It's, they don't have an NHL team. They had a WHA team. And we know about the baseball situation. And so honestly, it's it's something I don't think any of them saw coming. I think there is no better fan base right now that is buying up that stuff and appreciating it. And hopefully they can actually get some tickets in the LA Stadium. I don't know if they're in the right postcode or whatever. Well, yeah. the 49er fans got through that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they have more fans there than they did the Rams. Listen, it's in the same state. It's not like they flew across the country and dominated the freaking stadium. That's like a six-hour ride. That's, That's okay. That's explore. Listen, you got as many Jets fans as you do Giants fans as you do Bills fans here, so it's kind of the same. Mm. Could you imagine yeah. a game at Giants Stadium? The Bills would Bills would run the show. Mm -hmm. Right, not right about now they would. Yeah. The Rams are going. We didn't even talk about the Rams. We just talked about how bad Jimmy G was. But that Rams defense is legit. Matthew Stafford in his first year. I think a lot of us were on the Rams. And it was a little bit of a roller coaster ride throughout the season. But now you get yeah. guys who, listen, I think it's like his 13th or 14th year in the NFL, which is crazy. Stafford's going to get a chance to play for a Super Bowl. Aaron Donald's one of the greatest defensive players of all time. He will get a no chance question. to play for a Super Bowl. So there are feel-good stories. What I love most about this Super Bowl is that I don't give a damn who wins, and I'm just going to yeah. kick back and enjoy everything that happens because I really do enjoy both teams. I enjoy watching both teams. I don't mind the players on either team. So whoever wins, I'm like, yep, great, good for them. Exactly. I, the best part about that game uh, was the reaction of Matt Stafford's wife in, in the in the stands with a yep. minute to go, and good for them. They've had a roller coaster ride mm -hmm. themselves, um, and and now they're going to the bowl, and it. Same as you, Ashley. I, I don't have an axe to grind here. I don't have – I like both teams, I guess. 
Um, so yeah, I just want to sit back and watch a good football game. Let's not yep. have a blowout. Let's let's see what happens. You get two minutes left. Let's have somebody with the ball in their hands and a chance to win the Super Bowl. I love that stuff. And uh, we'll see if somebody can uh, can become a hero. We'll talk more about that next week. But yeah, it's it's going to be a lot of fun to watch. Uh, and I'm I'm looking forward to it already. If it's even close to the divisional weekend oh, and yeah. the championship yeah. weekend we had, I mean, those six games or yeah, six games were incredible. So if it's even close to any of those, I'd be happy. Sure. All right. Time to hear from our friends at Mohawk Honda. Yeah. Awesome. Hey, it's a new year with new goals. Start your new year right behind the wheel of a new or pre-owned vehicle that fits your budget and your new year's resolutions. Stop into Mohawk Honda and check out our broad selection of pre-owned inventory. We're here to find the right make, model, and price point to fit your budget. Our goal is to help you meet your goals. Let Luis, the VIP Man Morales, Jake Hot Sauce Doyle, Cards with Kern Svoboda, or Mark from Clifton Park Ellis Jr. connect you up with the perfect deal. All right now is the perfect time to get top dollar for your trade-in with the Kelly Blue Book Instant Cash Offer. Same day check in your hand, the day you trade in your vehicle. Just ask for Brian, buy with BMAC McKenna, Mike Benice, Nicole Ozer, or Cam, let's do a deal McKenna. Again, all of our sales and leasing consultants will make your New Year's automotive goals their top priority. Start the new year right with just the right deal at Mohawk Honda in Glenville, where they always go out of their way to please you. And if I can give a quick promo, because somebody had said, when are you talking hockey, Pucks? And I said, in two weeks, folks, we'll have Dan Rusinowski, the play-by-play voice of the San Jose Sharks, Ooh. as we talk hockey and ask him what the heck has happened to the Canadians, among other things. So we'll look forward to him joining us in two weeks as we uh, get out on the ice and play with some pucks. And I've also got a before we get to our next, and... what's that? Our next side. Before we get to our next side, I just want to a recap from last week of Joe Maniello. His uh, SNL actor bracket ended yeah. up in a in a in an all time record tie. Chris I mean, Farley and Eddie Murphy each with eight hundred and fifty three votes. <laughs> Uh, Joe decided not to go with a runoff. He said something like that crazy. 1,706 votes. Co-champs. Two Eddie winners. Murphy I enjoy it. Votes. It's one of the few times that I agree with co-champs. <laughs> There's nothing worse than co-champs in high school. This so I, I wish the two of them were, I wish one was still with us in Eddie Murphy. Yeah. They could go celebrate in Beverly Hills with nachos. Wouldn't that be fitting? Aww. All right. Pet peeves. This is going to be great. <laughs> Pet peeves in sports. May I start? Do it. Let's go one at a time, though. Okay. I like that because then we can talk about each one. I think they're. I think we're gonna. Pet peeves when when journalists, TV people, whoever are in such a rush to be first that they're not first and they jump the gun. Adam Schefter did it with the Tom Brady news. We talked before we went on the air. Adam Schefter had notification Brady was going to retire. He just broke it too early trying to be first and he honked off the Brady camp and, and it waited a few days. He should have waited till he got clearance. Okay. I've been in that spot before I've been asked to hold news for about the last time I did it was about 30 minutes. Not a big deal. I held off, got the go ahead. I was first with it on Twitter right before a press conference was starting. Sometimes you need to wait for this reason. Credibility. If you break something, you might know as fact, but you, you now may break a bond with other people. And Adam Schefter, with him doing that and going back to the Aaron Rodgers thing around the NFL draft last year, yeah, you're going to burn some bridges and people might be less inclined to talk to you. So you, you want to be first. You do risk not being first, but truth be told, you got to worry about future relationships and all that. So he has an issue now that he may have to uh, to fix up because – and truth be told, you know, you know how I feel about Tom Brady. He should have given Brady a chance to make his own make his own news on that one. I think that's the biggest problem I have with it. I don't agree with. Listen, if you're first and you're wrong, I have a problem with it. Adam yeah. Schefter was right. Adam Schefter yeah. had a source that knew Tom Brady was retiring, and whether or not Tom Brady is telling you the truth, I don't think he was telling you the truth when he said he hadn't yet decided. He just got his spot blown up. I understand. I'm not saying it's right. I'm not saying I would like, that's the one decision. I think you leave to the athlete. The athlete is retiring. Let him announce it. I get that. Yeah. I don't fault Schefter for going with it. He clearly heard it from someone he trusted, but in terms of like burning bridges, the guy's the most connected reporter 
in the NFL, bar none. He has everything. He has connections in every team. I'm sure more than one or two even. He'll be just fine. I'm, I have a problem if you're wrong. He wasn't wrong. I don't have yeah. a problem with it. I just wouldn't have done it when it comes to retirement. Well, Peter King wouldn't have done that. But then again, he didn't really have the, the new media. I, if you'd like, I will go into the Spreewell situation on this because we had this occur. We did have a, a reporter that uh, actually had an in and got a tip about Spreewell choking PJ. Uh, we were in the midst at the time of working a release, a statement, planning a press conference. Again, this is, you know, in Fred Flintstone era without any social media or cell phones, et cetera, just pagers. Fortunately, I was able to get grips of things, get it done and get it out there. And then a presser that night, reporter came up to me after and he said, I had this, I had this, I had this. I said, I understand that. I'll take care of you. My feeling was he did have it. We didn't do anything wrong. I was happy we could take care of all the media. And I did take care of him with some tickets to basically say, I know where you're coming from. We have a relationship. I know you had a breaking story. We did our job, but here, I didn't have to do that. But there is a, exactly right, Sean, there is a relationship. And when the term off the record is used, that means it's off the record. And if somebody crosses that path, uh, that relationship will be burned and that bridge is not repaired. Oh, yeah. Listen, off the record to me is off the record. Adam Schefter clearly had something on the record. He wouldn't have sure. gone with it. He would have had to, yes. Yeah, he wouldn't have gone with it off the record. Yeah, he just jumped the gun. That's all. I think you're right, Ashley. He, he got the right information. He just yeah. was too early. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> but was he? Like, that's what I mean. I just think, like, he was right and clearly – I just don't believe that Tom Brady was still mulling retirement. Like there's rumors out there that he's already taped a man in the arena episode that he potentially talks about his retirement. If that's how it got out, like that's not on him. If he got it from his agent, that's not on him either. So for me, I just don't think it was too early. I think people disagree with him doing it, which again, I said, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have done it, but he was right. So I just, I don't think it's wrong. Yeah. Ashley, what, what pet, pet peeve right. gets you rankled? I have a lot of them, but I'm going to start with this one because it was the first one that came to my mind. The automatic strike call on a 3-0 count. <laughs> Holy mother, if it's not a strike, don't call it a strike. I mean, you get balls that are a foot out of the strike zone that's a, yep. Just because he was taking it, just because he was taking the pitch on 3-0, because it's smart and you play the percentages. Well, don't play the percentages because you literally the percentage that the ump is going to call it a ball is 0% unless it goes over your head. It's absurd. I hate the, it's like an unspoken rule among umpires. It sucks. If it's not a strike, don't call it a strike. I agree with that. That goes back to a whole lot of unwritten rules oh. in baseball, which mm -hmm. now I think they're, you know, I disagree with. Yeah, you're right. It's not automatic. I might be looking to just walk them unintentionally. Right. If it's mm -hmm. not a strike, call it a ball. All right. I'm trying to avoid the strike zone. Stop calling it a strike. <laughs> <laughs> I'll throw the one and then I know we can discuss some more here. But to me, the one, two or five hour stinking pregame shows for playoff games. Okay? Oh. Not just talking Super Bowl. Everybody is watching the Super Bowl started at four Eastern. Yes, they'll watch it at 1 p.m. out there. Parties, and I know from hosting, parties shouldn't end at halftime because of a third quarter starting at 10 or 10.30 p.m. on a Sunday, okay? Baseball shouldn't start playoff games at 8.35, okay? You worried baseball about youth playing and, and the youth and the future fans. Start the stinking thing earlier. What's wrong with seven? They can miss Jeopardy for a night. And then if Boston plays New York, you know, the game is guaranteed to end by maybe the start of the Today Show. I mean, the times that we've been in the series, and I'm pouring down the coffee. So get rid of the stinking pregame shows. And I know Super Bowl coverage on Sunday will begin at 9 a.m. Yeah, it's crazy. I haven't watched pregame shows in football in well over 20 years. I can't oh, stand I watch it. It's all just a time. Do you really? Yep. I just can't do it. It's just a bunch of guys sitting around saying the same stuff. Well, the she's thing a with feature the... person. That's why, right? Because okay. she's great features. That's why she does. Well, yeah. And I just enjoy watching. Listen, that's my part of my job is like, so sure. I watch it to see what people do, how people speak, how, you know, it's not as much about the content as it is sometimes just to see, not critique, but sort of critique <laughs> what's going Research. on. Research. 
Yeah. Oh, that's good. But the start times, Eric, I agree with you. I mean, like a lot of these games, they alienate the entire East Coast just so the West Coast doesn't miss the first three innings driving home from from work. Mm -hmm. What yeah. other ones have you guys got? Some cookies. This a few uh, others. I've got one. Faking injuries in soccer. <laughs> This is mostly on the men's side, to be honest with you, because Do women, women don't look quite as much like men. You would think people are getting shot by a sniper from the roof of a yeah. stadium every time they get tripped with someone's foot. I played soccer. I've gotten tripped. Usually it doesn't even hurt. And they <laughs> act like they break their leg, tear an ACL, pop an Achilles every time they go down. And then all of a sudden, when there's no call or whatever it is, Pop right back up. Just stop doing it. As soon as you don't get the call, get back up. Yeah, my my other biggest pet peeve, and we talk about it almost every week on the show, is when coaches listen to their stupid analytics chart and go for two when they don't have to uh -huh. in the NFL. And I'll just incorporate analytics uh -huh. in general. You can uh -huh. overdo it with analytics. Major League Baseball is unwatchable. It's either a home run derby or a strikeout. And analytics has taught hitters that, there's no value in a ground out to the right side to move a runner over a sack fly. It's either all or nothing. And it's kind of really kind of ruined the sport. So analytics to, uh, to too far of a degree is a huge mm -hmm. pet peeve. And then the whole two point thing. I've talked about that too much already. Yeah. The two point thing was on my, my list too. Yeah. I got a few quickies for you. Check that. When an announcer says, check that you made a mistake, admit it. Don't say check that. Okay. Because <laughs> People think somebody else made a mistake. The term great success. The hell is that? Have you ever heard of lousy success? Uh, canceled or postponed. Okay. You can't have it both ways. Canceled means we'll never play them. Oh, yeah. Postponed means it's probably a rain out. We'll make it up. Yep. The other two, dynasty. You won a title and it's suddenly called budding dynasty. Remember when the Eagles and Peterson won the football Super Bowl? They were a dynasty. How'd that work oh, out? I hope that. At least win three in a row. And then the last one is when... I had to mention this. My wife beats me in a season-long football pick and pull. That's a pet peeve, at least for me. <laughs> That's just you get a little embarrassed. That's all. That's all. It's okay. Uh, one know. of my other big ones, guys, I have is court stormings. Uh, I hate <laughs> them. Number one, they're dangerous. Number two, they're idiotic. My thing is always act like you've been there before. If like the exception would be like if Furman knocks off number one Duke. Okay, maybe. But they're dangerous. I've seen Syracuse fans storm the court for beating Duke. Like, no, no, no. We're supposed to be on the same level. So don't act <laughs> yeah. like it's this huge deal when you beat Duke. Yeah. Act like you've been there. You want to be there. Act like you're there. I hate court stormings. I think they're ridiculous. I hate them in football. I hate them in basketball. I hate them. I hate them all together. Can, can I give something just because it's topical that's not a pet peeve, something I support 100%? Court stormings? No. Ice Christmas storming? trees in, Christmas storming? trees in February. Christmas trees in oh. February. Oh, go for it. Yeah, is that go anyone's pet peeve? Is me leaving my Christmas tree up, <laughs> us leaving our Christmas tree up, anyone's pet peeve over there? Not my pet peeve. I listen to Christmas music in July. He oh, does. Uh, listen, we normally do not, we leave it up longer than most people. I will admit we do leave it up into January. Generally, I would say like mid January because we so enjoy the whole vibe, turning the lights on at night in the dark. We love everything about it. Uh, this is still up because my husband and I literally are not in the same house at the same time for more than five minutes a day these days. And we like to do it together because it's kind of a team effort taking the thing down. So we're on the same schedule for the next two weeks starting Monday. I promise it will be down by next show. If I realized it, I'd have plugged in the Christmas lights that we put on for our kids yeah. when they're down here playing before the show. Aww, so it's so nice. My bad. To be honest, my parents, so it, it, this isn't weird to me because my parents have a tree at the top of their steps. It is their Christmas tree. But my mom's idea was to turn it into a holiday tree. So after Christmas, she decorates it with like snowflakes and icicles and white lights. It turns into a winter tree. It is currently awesome. a Valentine's Day tree with pink and whatever. It will be a St. Patrick's Day tree. She has ornaments for all of it, ribbons, lights. So I am very used to having a lit tree around all the time. It doesn't bother me. I really love it. That's awesome. More power to you. <laughs> yeah, it's just po I, every time I go to my parents' house, I get, I get that positive hey. vibe. 
See, you get again, a free pass. I agree with that. I'm Mr. Yeah. Positive. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Sometimes you are. But you it's get a free pass. People's pet peeve. I bet you there, if you asked people, I bet you leaving Christmas stuff up too long is a pet peeve of people. Not me. No, you get a free pass because you see your husband for six minutes at, with each other. Yeah. Uh, Never. Day, basically. Mm -hmm. So fun topic, though. Yeah, it was awesome. Right. I love it. Whiteboard? Whiteboard. First, Eric. Flo Hyman. Now, some young ladies today may not know who that is. I'm going to try to explain because as we're taping this February 2nd, it's National Girls and Women in Sports Day. Go, Ashley. Want to see yeah. you play football again. Now, this day is all about breaking the gender stereotypes built around the sports industry. Uh, it was first observed in 1987 to remember the Olympic volleyball player Flo Hyman and acknowledge her as the best female volleyball player of her time. She did a lot of work promoting equal representation of women in sports. And unfortunately, she died of a genetic disorder while playing in Japan at only 31 years old. But since then, the day has evolved to commemorate all women athletes, their achievements, their positive impacts of inclusion of women in sports, and to address the challenges regarding equal participation for women in sports. Uh, this day is celebrated, of course, in all 50 states. Personally, I want to... I want to mention that I was very fortunate to meet Flo Hyman. The date was September 13th, 1980. Remember the boycott? Well, the Olympic women's volleyball team came to our college, the University of New Haven, and I was a student assistant in the SID office. It was amazing. She and her teammates were gracious and kind. They put on a wonderful show while our student athletes enjoyed the experience just in awe. The North Campus Gym, as it was called, was packed. And it exploded when the Chargers got a point. We got a point. And Flo and her teammates came around the net and hugged our players in the court. Flo Hyman was a towering figure, and her legacy lives on today. Happy National Girls and Women in Sports Day, Flo Yeah, Hyman. yeah. I love it. <clears throat> uh, I am taking part. Obviously, we are in the Albany area. I'm taking part in an event Friday to celebrate girls and national women in sports day um, at the impact athletic center, where I will be a guest speaker among many other women, professionals, intern students. So it should be a lot of fun. So I'm happy Great. that you brought that up. Glad to hear. Hey, Ashley, before we go forward. Yeah. Just a reminder for our viewers, Johnstone supply in Troy is ready to help you as the frigid winter sets in this month. Now it's more important than ever to make sure your furnace or boiler is ready to handle the extra workload on the way this winter. Plus, what happens if your unit breaks down? Make sure you tell your family, friends, and more. The place to call is Johnstone, Johnstone Supply in Troy, 518-272-5922. The crew at Johnstone Supply will give you the advice you need to get out of that dilemma and figure out the best solution for you. If you already know you must make a change this winter, Johnstone Supply in Troy has a new high-efficient Goodman furnace and Naveen boiler. So stop in the 6th Avenue and learn more. Call Johnstone Supply in Troy, 518-272-5922, and do us a favor. Hit 2 for the counter guys and tell Tom, Kevin, James, or Rob that you heard it here on m and m, &M, &M across the board. Yeah, yeah. You Back going to the uh, Go ahead. The Commanders, the newest football team in the National Football League. And you know what? I don't really care. I have no vested interest. <laughs> They're in the Giants division. So I will. we will now be rivals with the Washington Commanders. I am just so thrilled that I no longer have to say the Washington football team and exactly. put in my graphics on television, Washington football team, and refer to it as WFT because it confuses me with WTF. <laughs> so yes. thank the good Lord that there is a name. It doesn't bother me. The name is fine. I'm not sure how Washington fans feel about it. I think it's kind of take it or leave it. It's not like super great. It's fine. George Washington was a commander. Seems to fit the bill. Uh, so yeah, I'm just very happy that after two seasons of WFT, we have a real team name that can have logos and uniforms, which I saw that are pretty cool. Good for the Washington football team. Now the commanders. Sad. The last two rebrandings, can, the, the best they could do is the Guardians and the Commanders. I know. They just look. If you're going to do Doesn't Commanders, go, go Commandos. What's your thing on Sunday? Your fans <laughs> can go Commando to the game to support the team. It was a layup, and they screwed it up. 
Yeah, I don't think there's really, but like, think about, we're just so ingrained with the names that we have. I think any name you pick is going to be pretty universally disliked and liked equally. Yeah. Like, I'm not sure that you're going to ever pick something that's so good. I, I, I'm happy on two fronts. One, we don't have fire, wind, uh, a bridge, inanimate objects, okay? It's something that could be a human being. We yeah. have a commander-in-chief in Washington good. and commanders in the Pentagon. So I, I, I think like it. It, it surprised me, and I think it's a very, very good name, fitting for the city, and it's not Americans, nationals, or senators anymore. Yeah, I like it. Yeah, right. All right, now I don't have my my black marker. My kids grabbed it, and who knows where it is. <laughs> I like crayon. Mark Davis, can you see this in crayon? Yeah, is that going to come off? There? Call it'll come off. Call Brian Flores. If the dude doesn't get a head coaching job, you need a defensive coordinator. Assuming you're not going to bring back Gus Bradley, the players show Brad they'll play hard for Brian Flores, and I think players will respect the decision he has made. And that is two great qualities that you can have in a coach. If he's not going to be a head coach. He can come and run the defense in Las Vegas. The Raiders are big in diversity. First Mexican-American coach, Tom Flores, African-American coach, Art Shell, Amy Trask, the highest-ranking female executive. The Raiders are built on that. Mark Davis was a little salty about the, the slight leak of emails a few months ago that they, they didn't do anything to the Washington football team, now commanders. All those got buried. So you want to stick it to the league? Hire Brian Flores. You'll be better off anyway, just in a football sense. Yeah. I hope he gets a job. If it's not a head coaching job, I yeah. hope he gets a D coordinator job. He deserves it. Yeah. But I hope he Shouldn't gets a head coach. Shouldn't lose his career for standing up for what's right. Yeah. Let's reward that for once in our freaking lives, right? Yes. yes. Try something new. Right. Let's not make it so wrong to do what's right. You know, like when you, if he gets blackballed, then nobody's going to start doing the right thing. So let's take the yeah. lead. And I'm not saying reward whatever, but – Reward him with what he deserves, which is a head coaching job. And if not a head coaching job, then a D coordinator job. If loving you is wrong, I don't want to do right. I don't want to be right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not singing. No thanks. I'm not a good singer. All right. Okay, folks. NHL two weeks from now. Next week, we will preview the Super Bowl. We'll talk a little bit of Olympics. It kicks off in Beijing. They're playing. They're curling today. We've already got Olympics going on. But we'll hit the Olympics a little bit and uh, preview some of the big stars and hopefully have some results to talk about. Good stuff. See you next week. You can find us online, Twitter, MMMATB1, Apple, YouTube, Spotify. Subscribe, listen, share. We thank you for your support. We'll see you next week. All right. Be good, everyone. Take care.